This is the In Context Podcast with your host, Karen Von Hippel. This is Karen Von Hippel. Welcome to this edition of In Context, Rusi's podcast with interesting individuals. Today, we were lucky to hear from Sir John Scarlett, chief of the Secret Intelligence Service. And in fact, he spent 38 years working inside the agency. You can imagine we didn't get too many secrets from him, but we had a really fascinating discussion. So welcome, Sir John Scarlett, to Rusi's podcast in context. Uh, Sir John Scarlett needs no introduction, but he is a retired senior intelligence officer, served as chief of the British Secret Intelligence Service, SIS or MI6, from 2004 to 2009. And Critically, he is the vice chairman of RUSI. Welcome, Sir John. Thank you very much. Um, pleased to be here, Karen. So we we always start at the very beginning with these podcasts. Uh, you are your father was a Scottish doctor, and you grew up in Southwark, London. That's uh, not quite right. Oh. <laughs> um, my um, I'm, my I'm learning father... how much uh, the research on you is not correct out yeah, there. Yeah, this often happens. And my father was a, a doctor. Mm-hmm. He was um, British French. My mother was a Scottish so- social worker. That's where it gets mixed up. Ah. And somehow that's how the bios come out. I see. And I grew up in Bromley. In Bromley. Okay, yeah, really. The, if I didn't know better, I'd suspect that you were sending the misinformation about your, your background out uh, there. I don't think that would be necessary. <laughs> so you married your university sweetheart, Gwenda, who was a linguist also at Oxford, right? Um, well, yes, Gwenda was at Somerville, uh-huh. um, uh, which was then a ladies only college. I was at Maudlin, which was then a men only, co- a boys only college. Um, we were both historians. Uh-huh. So we were both studying history, which is how we originally met. So she wasn't a linguist? No. I mean, she is actually a very good linguist. Okay. But uh, she was not studying it. Uh-huh. Mm. Okay. Okay. That's funny. We're already starting out with mistakes. Oh, dear. And you have four children, three girls and a boy. Yes. And your son was awarded the Military Cross for a rescue in Afghanistan in 2012. Uh, well, uh, it wasn't so much a rescue. A rescue. He was uh, his unit in um, uh, Helmand Province was attacked and ambushed, and was a firefight. And uh, wow. he was awarded the Military Cross for his um, his um, bravery in that ambush. And this is after you had already retired from. Uh, yes, this was, on, I'll government. tell you exactly, it was the 1st of July, uh, 2012. Yes, and, and a date etched in your history forever. Yeah. So you basically joined the uh, Secret Intelligence Service just out of Oxford, right? Uh, not quite. I had been out of Oxford for a year, mm-hmm. just over a year when I joined. So I wasn't a straight forward um, mm-hmm. you know, joiner in that way. And after I joined, I worked for a big manufacturing company, Management Trading Scheme. Mm-hmm. And uh, amongst other things, I applied for a job on the research side in the Foreign Office, a Foreign Commonwealth Office. And several months after submitting that application, which I'd just f- forgotten about, really, I got a, a letter, because you got letters in those days, asking me to come uh, to an interview with an organization I hadn't heard of before. I see. Yeah. So you were not tapped on the shoulder at Oxford like other people uh, no. used to be, right? No, Didn't I that wasn't. used to be the way they recruited people? Well, it's one of the ways. Uh-huh. Taps on the shoulder, I think, is a slightly, uh, I think, a simplistic way of putting it. I mean, people were, you know, some people uh, were talent spotted and picked out, you know, at that time, and then were maybe picked up, you know, later on, as mm-hmm. it were, in, in some way. But, you know, yes, essentially, it was through roundabout routes. Right. And in my case, it was because I had it anyway applied for a job in the, the Foreign, foreign Commonwealth Office. office. Right. And for whatever reason, the job application was diverted to the service. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's amazing that anyone could tell with a 20 or 21 year old that they would have a future in the secret intelligence service. It's quite interesting to think about what they were looking for even with these kids. Well, um, you know, it, they would be able to tell from your CV what your sort of intellectual achievement was mm-hmm. like. Uh, they were able to tell quite a lot about your interests, um, whether you had a natural um, interest and uh, experience overseas mm-hmm. and therefore internationally. Mm-hmm. And they maybe w- would have one or two references from people mm-hmm. who knew you. I mean, I don't know. But yeah. then you had to go through a selection process, which was pretty tough. Right. Uh, and they could test everything out then. 
So then I read uh, that you were inducted into the circus at Century House. I don't even know what that means. Well, Century House was the name of the building in which we, uh-huh. um, uh, in which our main office was in those days. Uh-huh. Yeah. So what do they mean by the circus? Just was it that was it? Well, that was just a, um, I don't know, that was just one of the names. It comes from novels. Okay. That's it's right. not like the farm, it's the no, CIA. No, it's, no, the serious people didn't use that. Uh-huh. Um, no, okay, no. okay. And it's interesting also that you were, that, the, you know, there's all this roundabout way of recruiting, as you say back then, because I think you were the first uh, director of the Secret Service that openly started recruiting versus doing everything in secret, right? Uh, yes. Well, it, it had progressively become more open. But the, in 2006, which was during my time as, as uh, head of the service, we um, created for the first time a website for, mm-hmm. for the service, which of right. course we had never had before. Right. And in a way, it flowed naturally from mm. that website that it should end up you know, being a forum for recruitment mm-hmm. and a- applying. And then very quickly it became clear that you know you could apply to join, which you couldn't do before. Right. And then once you do that and you have people applying through a public process, then of course that has to be the only way you do it. You mm-hmm. can't have alternative ways of recruiting, yeah. uh, otherwise it wouldn't be correct and wouldn't be fair. Right. So you know we move very quickly yeah. to public recruitment. Right. That's interesting. Uh, we're getting a bit ahead of ourselves, though. So you you. Let's see, did you, when you joined, you stayed in London and then your first uh, posting was to Nairobi in 73, 74. I was trying to think what was interesting that was happening in Kenya back then. Well, uh, we were in Kenya and um, East Africa. We were still very much in the Mm -hmm. post-colonial period. It was only 10 years um, afterwards. Of course, the post-colonial authorities were still in power Mm -hmm. and the big sort of formerly settler community was still quite largely there. And so Kenya was seen as in you know terms of what has happened elsewhere in uh, colonies and so on, was seen as a, uh, um, as a former colony and state which was stable mm-hmm. and had political stability and good potential and growth in the economy mm-hmm. and had good relations with uh, the UK. Mm-hmm. Uh, was Kenya still alive? Yes, she yeah. was alive. It's interesting. I lived in Kenya many years later, and so many people look back to that period as you know, much more successful country and you know, fewer challenges, etc. I don't know if it's just one of those rosy-eyed things, or if it really was. Well, I in think a it's an ele- there's an element of uh, nostalgia there. Yeah. It was still very much. I mean, it wasn't a segregated country, but of course, you know, there were differences in the still way people divided, lived. Yeah. Um, it was still quite strongly in the post-colonial mm-hmm. atmosphere, but a very big difference uh, between now and then, of course, is just in the not just the nature of the economy, but the um, size of the population. Mm-hmm. I am. Um, right. I think in my time, uh, the citizenship, um, the population of Kenya was about 11 million people, yeah. and it's probably now four times that. Yeah, right. At least, if not more. And of course, there are all the Somalis and others that are there as mm-hmm. refugees. So you were there for basically two years. A uh, year and a half. A yeah. year and a half. And then you came back to the UK and then you went to Moscow in 76 for your second post. You know, had you already, oh, you came back to learn Russian, right? You didn't. Yes, no, I was brought back um, early uh, mm-hmm. from uh, Nairobi and sent to the Army School of Languages mm-hmm. in Beaconsfield, where I did one year full time. Uh, learning Russian. Mm-hmm. And you already spoke some French as well. Yes, uh, from well, university. a little bit. A little that, bit stage, yeah. that came later on. Uh-huh. Yeah. And uh, so then you went out there and uh, it really was at the height of the Cold War in many ways, right? The, the mid to late 70s. Uh, it's, you know, all those movies and, and books and the John le Carre period, etc. There must have been, it must have been an exciting time to be there. Well, yes and no. It was extremely interesting being there, of course. It was at the height of the Cold War. It wasn't the most tense period mm-hmm. in the Cold War. It was actually in a period of detente um, in the late 70s. It was beginning to get tougher again. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, there were confrontations in Africa and so on. But, I mean, in a way, my memory of it was it was a very controlled society. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it was already clear that that control which was bordering on boredom, really. Mm-hmm. The propaganda had lost its inspiration. And it was people were just going through the motions. And it was beginning to be clear, although I didn't fully understand it, that the economy had, um, had issues and had mm-hmm. problems. So it seemed quite a sort of placid and stagnant. I think stagnant is mm-hmm. the word, uh, time. And I remember thinking, 
uh, driving across the um, the river one day uh, and comparing what was happening in China with the death of Mao Zedong and so on, that it was you know, interesting that nothing like that was happening in Russia mm-hmm. and uh, it seemed much more interesting in China <laughs> uh, from a political point of view. Right. But of course, um, it was a very interesting place to be. Did you spend all your time going to cocktail parties and trying to recruit agents? And No, it was more complicated than that. <laughs> no, I, I, no, I didn't. Did your family go with you? They did. Yeah. yeah. In fact, my six-week-old daughter was one of those who came with me and arrived at the end of January 1976 when the temperature was minus 30. Holy cow, yeah. Yeah, Russia was cold. Yeah, it was quite cold. Yeah. yeah. So you were there for two years, basically, right? I was there for, no, I was there for just over a year. Okay, and then you came back to London for, looks like, about seven years. Yes, I had quite a long period in London. And that's when the whole Gordievsky affair happened. And I know we, we, you know, you don't want to talk about that in terms of, you know, your involvement in this, even though he has talked about you in in his book and others have talked about this. But just generally, uh, that story, do you have any reflections just in general about all the double agent stuff going on and on both sides, really. I mean, it must have been an interesting... Well, of course, you know, that the 1980s were, as it turned out, the final period of the Cold War, though we didn't know it at the time. And nobody predicted it at the time, whatever they say now. And, of course, that particular operation is, you know, is, is, is a high-profile operation now. And, of course, you know, I was aware of it. And... You know, there are certain things about it which are worth commenting on. I think the main one is the extraordinary personal qualities and uh, personal bravery and commitment of Oleg Gordievsky. Mm -hmm. You know, he absolutely um, was, is, as he is described. Uh, He has those uh, qualities, completely reliable, completely straight, uh, very, very brave. And very disillusioned with what was happening in his own country. But it wasn't, I think dissolution is not quite the right word, actually. Mm-hmm. He was he was just ideologically motivated to change things. Mm-hmm. And um, he was committed to his understanding of Western liberal democracy, mm-hmm. which certainly didn't exist in the Soviet Union. Yeah. And he has described in his various books and works, you know, very well, the sort of process, intellectual process, uh, which he went through, mm-hmm. um, which reached a sort of culminating point initially during the construction of the Berlin Wall, 19, August 1961, mm-hmm. when he happened to be there mm-hmm. on, I think, a training exercise of some kind. And then, of course, through the 60s and the invasion of Czechoslovakia, mm-hmm. for example, that was obviously a big moment. And he sort of described those moments of ideological disillusion. Mm-hmm. I mean, for those of you who don't for those of our listeners who don't know this story, he was recruited in London to be a double agent. Uh, he provided a lot of information, more than a thousand reports about Soviet secrets back then. Then they were suspicious in, in Moscow and called him back in the mid 80s. And then this very brave exfiltration process, which is a word I learned when I was working for the US government. I didn't know what it meant the first time I saw it, but basically getting him the heck out of there uh, by SIS and his family as well. And it involved shopping bags and all these uh, secrets. Well, actually, uh, quite, I, I need to interrupt. Quite, quite, <laughs> quite of that detail It's not right. Actually. Okay, please, um, please correct me. And um, I won't go over the whole history again, but it is, um, it is written up and in the public domain. But as I understand it, the story is that he was... Um, recruited while he was in Copenhagen. In that's the 19, right, that's in the right. I did see that. Yeah, that's my fault. Yeah. Um, he went back to Moscow in 1978. And, the, and uh, the Danes thought they couldn't do it on their own, so they asked for help from the Brits. Well, they were very good allies. Right. Yeah. And um, uh, he went back to Moscow, and then he managed really to get himself posted to London in 1982. So he came to London as a senior member of the KGB residence in London, and eventually, by early 1985, he was the head, the KGB resident um, in London. Uh, and then uh, for reasons which are still not, you know, I think completely clear, but they're written up in various books. Um, he was called back to Moscow and uh, interrogated and arrested and so on. And then, as you say, he was successfully exfiltrated, not his family, just on his own. Okay. In, um, oh, that's uh, right, because didn't his wife then go to prison 95. for a while? And then no, she, she didn't. She didn't go to prison. She okay. didn't. Lots and lots of variations on this story. She came yeah. out with um, their children uh-huh. in um, 1991, okay. immediately after the, um, the coup against Gorbachev, the failed oh. coup. 
Okay. And then join him in London, in but London. then they got divorced, right? Uh, yes, that's yeah. right. Subsequently, yeah. But, but it was a very da uh, daring, however it happened, it was a very daring exfiltration process. I would have been very nervous, let's just say, had yeah. I been involved with it. Now, question for you, back when, uh, this is more of a generic question, but if he was in London and he's head of the KGB, and that's a huge coup to get someone like that to to work for, for the British services, how would the coordination have gone between MI5 and MI6, given that, you know, there obviously are clear lines between the two, but in something like this, it should have involved both, I would imagine. Well, that's a good question, Karen. Um, of course, um, in novels and in literature and in legend, it, when people always sort of talk about rivalries between the services and so on. In my experience, that's completely untrue and unfounded. Uh, there's extremely good collaboration and coordination and mutual understanding and just responsible behavior. And uh, this um, operation is an extremely good example of it. Yeah, well, they had a shared mission and everyone was probably was very a, nervous about it going wrong. Well, yes, but you did your best to right. you know, try to make sure right. that didn't happen. It was completely joined up um, right. Uh, effort. Right, interesting. And, and I remember someone, a friend who was a former intelligence officer, saying to me, I think it's even a bit of a mantra, you know, your agent is everything and you have to do everything you can to protect your agent. So you must be in your head when you're running an agent, just constantly thinking about that person and constantly thinking about what they're doing and trying to second guess yourself or second guess them the whole time, right? I mean, I guess if you've done it several times, you've probably figured it out, but it must be pretty nerve wracking. Well, the to case officer is, is responsible in a very obvious and direct way for the well-being and safety um, right. of uh, an agent. And that's right. the job of a case officer. Right. Yes. But that, yeah. that, to me, that also would make me very <laughs> nervous, I think, if I had to do that. Well, it's not a normal job, obviously. Yeah, right. Uh, no. Right. I mean, I guess you get trained to do that as well. It must be part of your training, but not everybody is good at that, I would imagine. Right. Can you learn to spot someone who has that talent for, for managing well, we've been quite good at it over the years yeah. um, as, an organ as a service. And so the answer is yes. Yeah. 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 And the training part too. So that was in the 70s and then into the mid 80s when he was back. Now, at this point, you were 84, 85, you had gone to Paris. And yeah. so you must have been in Paris when that whole exfiltration was happening. I was. I was. And how was your French at this point when they sent you to Paris? Oh, it was much better by then. Had you done language training? You know, again? I'd, uh, I'd done um, in quite intensive training Back before, in Beaconsfield? Or? Uh, before I went. No, no. Beaconsfield was the Army School of Languages for Russian and Arabic. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, no, uh, French was much more relaxed. Um, but I did spend a bit of time in Paris. And um, anyway, my grandmother was French. I had long connections oh, right, with it. Right, yeah. Of course, yeah. Uh, and so I was motivated. Right. And yeah. my family were motivated too, of course. Going to Paris was very, very nice. Yeah, hardship post, I can imagine. Yeah. Um, but this is, of course, still during the Cold War. So, you know, I bet you, you were still focused a lot on what was happening in the Soviet Union, yeah. East Germany, right? Yeah. I mean, that would have been probably a main, and working with allies, working with the French very closely. Yeah. Right. And you develop some very strong relationships because, of course, I gave you the Legion d'honneur later. And one thing I read, and maybe this isn't true as well, <laughs> but that you were one of the early ones to recognize that Gorbachev was unlikely to hold on to power and that Yeltsin was likely to come in. Is that correct? Or is that another? Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't know who wrote that. <laughs> um, no, it's, it's not correct. Uh, I am, um, you know, of course, like everybody else, in those uh, Gorbachev years, I was trying to understand, you know, what was going on. And I was trying, in particular, I was trying to work out, well, it, you know, is this change sort of fundamental or is it superficial? And uh, I quite clearly remember in about 1990, so, you know, a long way into the um, reform process, um, I read the um, Children of the Arbat, famous novel, and which was, you know, being published in Moscow. And I do remember thinking and saying to my wife, for example, that the fact that this was being published in, in Moscow was a remarkable change mm -hmm. from our day when such things just simply weren't published. And that sort of, I remember that as one of the moments when I began to think, yeah, okay, this is, um, this is different. There's a process here which is, you know, if it carries on, it's really going to be very substantial. That said... I definitely did not anticipate or really understand the rapidity or the scale of the change that was about to take place. Right. I didn't anticipate it. 
I certainly didn't anticipate the fall of the and collapse of the Soviet right. Union. And I've, although some now you meet people who say they did, I don't believe them. Yeah, probably. I never remember hearing anybody right. tell me that. Right, you right, know. Right. And, and I was in Moscow at the time when it collapsed. And I know that just a few weeks before, we were not anticipating it. Right. But uh, had you or had people that you knew spent time outside of Moscow in, you know, in the far reaches of, of the Soviet Union? I wonder if it was easier or harder to notice what was going on in places like that. And maybe have maybe it was happening more in the center anyway than... Well, it's a good question, um, but that really the dynamics of the situation were happening in, in Moscow itself, mm -hmm. I think, mm -hmm. and um, in Petersburg, uh, which, of course, by then had changed its name back uh, from Leningrad, which was a pretty big deal, too. Yeah. You know, and obviously someone like, like me as a historian understood that it was a big deal to mm -hmm. change the name uh, like that. Mm -hmm. But even then, I'm not sure I fully grasped mm -hmm. the, the significance of it. But out in the sort of the wider Soviet Union... I don't know, at that stage, I wasn't mm. traveling there, but I think they were slower to catch up. You know? So the Berlin Wall fell in December 89, right? Uh, and November, from, yeah. From yeah. My, uh, November. I mean, most people remember, I was actually here in the UK when that happened, I remember that. So how much longer did it take for the Soviet Union to, to really implode another year and a half? Well, of course, um, the, uh, it was um, two years later that the collapse happened. And um, the uh, decision to disband the Soviet Union happened, I think, in early December uh, 1991. Mm -hmm. And then the actual day on which it formally uh, ended was Christmas Day 1991. So you um, went, you were already back in 91. When did you get back in 91? Uh, we, I went there in Oct early, Oct uh, I went there in October 1991. Oh, okay, so literally months before. Uh, well, yes, I went two months before. Wow. Uh, the collapse, two and a half months before, and uh, I certainly wasn't expecting it to collapse. I wasn't thinking like that, although mm -hmm. I knew clearly that we were in a very dynamic period uh, after the end, of, after the failure of the coup. And really, from the moment, from the failure of the coup through to the moment of the collapse, and then really... Failure of the coup in 93. No, the, the, oh, the, coup, the coup against Gorbachev, um, oh, I guess Gorbachev and, Gilson, and right. uh, okay. KGB people and so on, the military people, that was in August uh, 1991. Uh -huh. yeah. And that lasted for two days, and, mm. uh, and then uh, the coup collapsed. Uh -huh. And Yeltsin, um, that was his great moment of um, success and of triumph. Right. And then Gorbachev remained president until Christmas Day 1991 when he resigned. And when, I he, when he resigned, that was the end. Okay. And you were, were you station chief at the time? I was. And did you meet Yeltsin? Did you meet Gorbachev? Did you get to know? No, no you didn't see them. So yeah, well, I knew quite a lot of people, but I didn't meet them. No. Uh-huh. And then you stayed through 94. So really a tumultuous period. Yeah. Uh, a lot going on as, as we were talking about earlier, I was there in, in 93 when I guess another potential coup against Yeltsin, right? When the White House Yes. was uh, being burnt down. In White, fact, White House siege. I was there over Halloween and someone dressed up as the White House and they were smoking a cigar <laughs> to demonstrate the smoke. But uh, it was a very chaotic time during that period. I guess it must, must have been a time for all intelligence agencies from the West to be hoovering up information because there are probably plenty of people willing to sell. Although you may not have known what was reliable or not. No, well, it was it was actually quite a lot more complicated than that. Uh, the um, uh, my memory of that time when I was there in that way, um, of course, it was absolutely dramatic, but it was also in many ways it was very moving. But it was also, you know, to quite a significant degree, uh, there were elements of tragedy and, and personal tragedy about it. And you know, because in the embassy we dealt with um, officials and uh, uh, representatives from the government and. And we, you know, we knew what sort of people they were and we saw how they were having to manage this incredibly difficult and stressful situation with their country collapsing uh, around them. Mm -hmm. uh, and after all, they went from being a superpower to being sort of nothing, you know, in a couple of years. And they were completely unprepared for it I mean, because it hadn't been a free uh, right. you know, society. Right. Uh, nobody was ready. There'd been no preparation right. for it. There was no, you know, nothing. And it just suddenly happened. Right. And just people were astounded. Right. And uh, it was coupled with economic collapse. And economic collapse means economic collapse. You know, people were out on the streets selling their personal belongings and yeah. they'd had stored up sometimes since before the revolution in right. their cupboards and so on. And, and they were just selling everything off. And people had pensions which were worth nothing and so mm. on and so forth. Right. 
and it was, n- and they'd done nothing wrong at all. Right. And I was um, very conscious of that. You know, watching a, a society collapse like that yeah. at every level, right. particularly if it's a superpower, um, it's quite something. Uh, right. And you know, when we were there, we were aware of the somehow or another the significance and deep, deep nature of that. Right. I mean, it I was mem- a very, very, very um, significant time. Yeah, I mean, but I also remember, you know, back in the, the rest of the West, there was a bit of naive optimism that it can somehow just evolve into a democracy capitalist system when there was, you know, there was no floor. And as you say, so many people had nothing and people were buying homes, trying to, there were all sorts of speculation yeah. going on as well, which would left so many people out outside. Um, and there are many people of probably of certain generations who just didn't know how to cope because they'd only dealt with one kind of system, whereas the younger people usually learn to adapt much quicker than some of the older people. Um, but we obviously, there must have been other things we should have done. You know, the benefit of hindsight, if you look at where Russia is today, I mean, was it a bit naive of all of us to assume it could just become a democracy? Is there, are, are there other things we should have all done to try to help smooth that transition? Well, I'm not sure. Everybody did assume that, really. Um, I think the pace and scale of of change and events was so great that it was very difficult to really track and to predict. Of course, there was a a optimistic, maybe uh, naive, quite general feeling that somehow Russia would move towards a more liberal democratic approach, uh, rather like, you know, we've been assuming that with China until uh, recently. Uh, but of course, Erroneously, there well, too. Well, you know, life isn't like that. Mm. Uh, but um, I'm always wary of when people talk about this in a sort of self-critical way uh, about well, the West should have done this, the West should have done that. We made this mistake, we made that mistake, and no doubt that, of course, mistakes were made. And there's a lot of expert study that's been done about mm-hmm. that. But it's all with the benefit of hindsight. Yeah. General hindsight is always right. Yeah. And the sheer scale of the event was such. And the speed with which it happened, almost inevitably, you know, the outcome was mm-hmm. sort of rather chaotic. And, you know, the re-establishment of a tough system of authoritarian control was pro- perhaps just inevitable. Right. You know, I, you know I, I don't know. And you can see the arguments for it, right. you know, even if we do, of course, feel disappointed about it. Well, there, you know, whenever there is a bit of a power vacuum, I mean, the first to fill that vacuum are the criminal elements. And certainly that mm. was the case in, in much of the former Soviet Union, right? Well, you know, there was huge national wealth um, tied up in natural resources and so on. And um, it suddenly didn't have ownership. Yeah. I uh, remember I went to, to St. Petersburg and uh, the woman who gave me a tour of the museums and all that was telling me how she wouldn't want to advertise her company because if she advertised it, then people would come and try to start getting her to pay, yeah. basically pay her to do nothing really, but to protection. Well, you know. Petersburg was, um, I think in my memory is Petersburg, let's say at the end of 1991, it was a particularly bad moment. Uh, it was very badly hit. Mm-hmm. And if you walk down the Nevsky Prospect then, the streets were just lined with mm-hmm. people selling things. Yeah. yeah. And it's changed so much as well. Uh, there were, you know, there were very few Western restaurants and now you go back to Russia yeah. and it's just completely different place, yeah. isn't it? The transformation, I mean, not all in, in, in a good way, obviously. Okay. So back to uh, this, you stayed there until 94 and then you were unceremoniously booted out of the country. Do you want us to tell us, do you want to tell us a little bit about what happened? Well, I wouldn't say it was quite as brutal as that. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I was asked to leave uh, politely and um, I did, you know, leave without a big fuss and a big deal. And I think some people were a bit sorry to see me go and and see the relationship which we were trying to create with their Russian services, you know, um, undermined in that way. But it was, in a, it was, it was quite complicated, but essentially we were still adapting uh, to the new situation. Yeah. And there were problems about um, granting a visa for various reasons, which I can't, can't quite remember them all now, to my opposite number coming as the representative here. Mm-hmm. And um, so a visa was not given. And then almost inevitably, really, um, after a few months, you know, I had to leave as well. And it, initially that was all quite discreet. But eventually it became public uh, knowledge that I had been asked to leave. And so that was a, a media story for a right. few days. And they took a photograph of you 
arriving back in the United well, Kingdom. Well, no, um, I'd gone. I'd already arrived back two weeks before, uh -huh. and I'd gone to the airport to meet uh, uh, my wife and son, uh, who I were see. coming back because they'd been allowed to stay until the end of the son's uh -huh. term at the Anglo American School, and then he was photographed marching through uh, the. Um, uh, exit gates, as it were, um, uh, aged eight, uh, carrying a sword on his shoulder. <laughs> you remember that? And so that was, I mean, you know, somehow or another, the media had known that I was going to be there uh -huh. and that it was a story. So that was when it became known and publicly acknowledged that um, I was uh, a member of the service. I see. Yeah. And, and your children had lived with you in Paris and in Russia, so they learned Russian and French? Uh, well, my children... Um, uh, it was quite complicated. Um, they all, well, my three daughters all went eventually to boarding school. Mm -hmm. uh, my son was qu quite a lot younger mm -hmm. and uh, didn't have to go to boarding school. They, um, uh, my my daughters um, all um, uh, speak French and are uh, fluent in it. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, was helped by uh, being in, in, in Paris. And two of them did go to school in Paris. So that's very good. So the family but they didn't is, learn any Russian? No. Uh -huh. Well, um, a, a bit, but mm -hmm. uh, they weren't sufficiently integrated in Russian mm -hmm. life. Yeah, I think they kept uh, the foreign kids separate, didn't they, in different schools? And... Well, I mean, not necessarily. By the 90, early 90s, you know, things were very different from right. what they had been in the Soviet it's days. Cool. And, you know, we were able to mix. It was mm -hmm. much, much more interesting uh -huh. from the personal point of view yeah. being there in the early 90s compared yeah. to the 1970s. Yeah, it was much, much, much more interesting. And one got to know people and one had much more freedom of uh -huh. movement and maneuver and lived much more naturally. But um, by that stage, uh, my daughters were all at boarding school and, um, or at university. And um, my son went to the Anglo-American school where they, you know, mm -hmm. they spoke English. Right. Yeah. And do you still go back to Russia? The last time I was there was in 2011. Uh-huh. Okay. I haven't been back since. You watch, really? I, I could have been, but I just haven't been. Yeah, you, know. you haven't gone. So you came back to London and uh, were, you know, were one of the directors uh, at SIS. And then in 2001... You resigned from the security services to well, security services MI6 to uh, become chairman of the Joint Intelligence Committee, the JIC, in the Cabinet Office. Now, how long had the committee been around? The Joint Intelligence Committee been around well, since 1936. Since 36, okay. quite a long time. Yeah. yeah. So, so uh, of course, you were in that office one week when 9/11 happened. Yes, I'd been. Um, I'd been in six days. Uh -huh. Six you, working days. Can you tell our listeners what the JIC does? Well, the Joint Intelligence Committee, uh, when I was uh, when I was there, is a cross departmental committee with representatives from um, all the intelligence services, from the Ministry of Defence, from the Foreign Commonwealth Office, and related um, um, agencies and departments. And it's sort of well, you know, I mean, it's basically pretty flexible, but essentially, you know, used to meet once a week, and it would. It was responsible for overseeing the work of what was then called the um, uh, JRC Secretariat in the Cabinet Office, which was a small unit uh, which was responsible for bringing together in intelligence and analysis from different government departments and was the central place where intelligence analysis was done. So in the British system, uh, whereas in the US, let's say CIA analysis or in many other services, most other services actually analysis is part of the functions of the foreign intelligence service. That's not the case here. Mm -hmm. The intelligence service collects the intelligence and other people do the analysis. Uh -huh. and, and the main centre for that, not the only centre, uh -huh. but the main centre for that is the Joint Intelligence Committee, which was set up in 1936 and then very much developed during the war. So 9-11 happens and here's another one of those chaotic really change-making events, uh, global events that happened. And uh, some people claimed that they knew it was going to happen. And obviously most of the rest of us had no idea that was about to happen. But I guess from 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 the UK perspective, obviously many of these, uh, the 9-11 hijackers had spent time in, in different parts of Europe. So there probably were a lot of ways that the European intelligence agencies were working very closely to try to piece together a lot of this with the, with the Americans. I would imagine. Well, um, I mean, you're, you're right in saying people, you know, are sometimes inclined to say that they knew it was going to happen, like they knew that the Soviet Union was right. going to come to an end. Um, I don't remember anybody really. I've never seen any evidence that people seriously knew that it was going to happen, certainly not in the form it, it did take. So, you know, it was just a, a stunning surprise. Mm -hmm. uh, and like everybody else, I have a memory of that day, what I was doing, and uh, I was 
meeting with somebody in my office, in the cabinet office, and my private secretary came in and said, you better turn on the television. So I turned on the, the television and I saw the immediate sort of aftermath of um, the Twin Towers standing there, but after the first attack. And so I went to the phone, pick up the phone to ring the cabinet secretary. And while I was standing there waiting for him to come to the phone, I saw this second plane go in. And I, I do remember thinking two things, and this is absolutely what I remember. One was that it's a good thing that I'm used to stress and, and that I'd learned to cope with stress in my old job because I was going to get a lot of it, which was certainly true. Mm -hmm. And secondly, that my life would never be the same again. I do remember thinking that. Mm -hmm. And of course, those things were true. Right. It was a life-changing moment for lots of people, right. but certainly uh, me. Right. Yeah. And and so you really were at, at some of these places at really pivotal times in history. And so you were at the JIC through from 9-11, basically, and uh, a little bit after the, the war in Iraq started. Yep. And I know that's been beaten to death by a lot of people, uh, you know, with various Chilcot and other inquiries. I don't think we need to, to revisit any of that. But I suppose... In terms of the Iraq war and the role that intelligence played, I mean, thinking back on it now, do you feel that, that some people have lost faith in, in intelligence or do you feel that that was a time when intelligence was seen to be manipulated and now many of the intelligence agencies have learned a lot? I know the U.S. intelligence agencies have learned a lot after that. Yes, well, I, I, you know, uh, it's tricky to get into all the detail there. And obviously, you know, what happened uh, and then the reaction to it in the States is sometimes different from right. what happened and the reaction to it in the, in the UK. Um, in the UK, I think there have been certainly, uh, I've seen uh, five inquiries um, take place around um, all these um, events. I mean, your question is, of course, a fundamental one and, and, and a good one. I, I think it may be right to say, I mean, obviously, and understand naturally, uh, there is, um, if intelligence is just quoted as a sort of self-standing argument in support of something, you know, or well, the intelligence tells us so, so it must be right. I mean, obviously, you know, you can't get away with saying that, but you probably never should get away with saying something like that. So obviously, ev everything is more complicated than that. And intelligence is only ever part of a, um, of a picture. And so naturally, there's going to be questioning of, um, you know, that kind of assertion, or there's going to be questioning um, about, well, what does the intelligence tell us, you know, about this and about that and about the other, whatever the crisis might be, including crises at the present time. But in essence, my experience is that the, the, the intelligence services are respected and that um, are the ones that our own services and those of our close allies are respected and they deserve to be respected yeah. and they do an, a very, very important uh, job, which is respected, in, right. broadly speaking, in my experience, but obviously not by everybody. Right. No, I And mean, it's quite right that things should be challenged. Yeah, no, I agree with you. In fact, when I was in, worked in the State Department and I had access, because I was working on counterterrorism, I had access to a lot of intelligence and also ways that the U.S. community had tried to fix the challenges or the mistakes right. that had been made. So it's very interesting to see it from the inside. And I agree with you, it was really hardworking, dedicated people who just really knew their portfolios incredibly well. And often that can be manipulated as well by politicians. And so sometimes it's also about, do you trust the politicians? So Trump is a great example where he decries his own intelligence agencies, which is undermining morale, obviously. But at the same time, then when Trump or Pompeo make assertions, what the intelligence is telling them, for example, with Iran, Many people don't believe them because they don't believe the politicians. I don't think it's a reflection of the intelligence. I think they think that the politicians are are changing the story to fit what they want to do. Um, well, okay, but I um, I think once one gets into serious debate and you know there's a good amount of detail that comes out, I think you know those debates and discussions usually end up in quite an informative and balanced way. Yeah, I, it's it's hard for the intelligence agencies to get involved in these as well, because obviously they can't go public with what's going on behind the scenes. Well, quite a lot goes public in the United States. Yeah, sometimes it does, doesn't it? Yeah. So in, then in 2004, you were you were made C, as in chief of, this, of MI6, uh, Secret Intelligence Service, SIS, and you stayed there until 2009. And you were the first publicly photographed C, because obviously you had already been photographed 
uh, beforehand. Uh, and so people knew that you were, as you were just saying. I'm, the, I'm not sure I was the first publicly photographed, but obviously okay. over the, as the years have gone by and since the, the chief of the service has first been publicly acknowledged, which yeah. only happened in 1993, yeah. then obviously there is a tendency for the profile to go up, yes. And, and as we mentioned earlier, you were the first head of service who really engaged in, in promoting uh, employment and trying to diversify employment at a SIS, trying to get it to reflect more the, the makeup of the country mm -hmm. to try to bring in people from diverse backgrounds with, with different language skills, publicly recruiting, as you said. Uh, you were also known for promoting women and getting them in operational roles. Uh, so uh, in terms of really focusing on management. It's interesting you talked to Alex Younger, the current head of SIS today, and he's also very focused on the people and uh, values of, of the place. Because of course, these institutions and organizations, you want people to feel proud to work there. You want them to feel value in it. And you want people to feel that they have a chance, no matter what their background is, to, to rise in the services. Well, um, you know, those are all those are all good points. I honestly think that um, in you know recent times, certainly, and um, it's also been true of my successor John Soares, that one of the people have worked hard, and the chiefs of the service have worked hard to adapt to change, to create an atmosphere of um, of trust, or to promote an atmosphere of trust uh, within the service, of open debate, of free speech. You know, avoiding received ideas and uh, and and so on, and being free to challenge, you know, authority if you think you've got good reason for it, and all those things. Uh, but also, uh, fundamentally, being um, open to change, mm -hmm. uh, because of course it's just happening all the time, mm -hmm. and it's happening faster and faster, and it's a combination clearly of workforce changes, um, diversity, um, social changes. Technological advances, and as then well. of course it's all right. completely interlinked in right. with um, a technology uh, change mm -hmm. and communications change. And after right. all, if you're in the um, intelligence business, you're in the information business. Right. And if you're in the information business, you're in the data business. Right. And if you're in the data business and the communications and so on. Right. Um, so it's a um, fundamental right. um, issue. Right. Um, absolutely fundamental issue. Right. And you're at the very centre of change and maintaining your capability which you've inherited from the past, and then adapting it to current conditions and making it flexible for mm -hmm. the future, you know, is, is extremely demanding. And okay. I know that my successors um, have um, worked very, very hard at that. And do you still think the services value agents and or recruiting agents yes. just as much as eavesdropping and all the other things you can do with technology? Well, to put that in context, at the end of the Second World War, after the you know, enormous successes um, of Bletchley Park and the interception of enemy communications and so on, which are, you know, played an absolutely fundamental role in the conduct and the successful conduct of the war, there definitely was a feeling around, I think, in the JIC and so on at the time, that that was the future um, for intelligence. It was technological. Right. Of course, it, you know, it was true to a degree, but the other great point was that it was also human intelligence. Mm -hmm. And the reality is it's a mixture of the two. Mm -hmm. And we learned that right. um, in the post-war period. Mm -hmm. took quite a long time to, right. to learn it. Different skills involved. And I'd say, you know, if it was true in 1945, uh, which was a pretty dramatic time, it's also uh, true now. Right. And um, experience that shows that to be true because at the end of the day, human beings are human beings. Right. The other interesting part to me about organizations and and, and their, you know, organizations in a sense can have personalities is in the services a large part about of, of these jobs is is managing risk yep. and managing uncertainty yep. and probably you do it much more obviously in the intelligence world because you don't always know if you can trust people and you're putting people's lives at risk your people and your agents lives at risk at times and so there you know that that aspect of it uh would i would imagine give everyone an ulcer who worked at sis well you know, in most areas of business and other activity, uh, trust is an important issue. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in very many areas, you're never quite sure that you can yeah. trust people. Yeah. I'm not sure that's automatically, you know, a feature of um, of that profession, or that might seem to be. But I mean, clearly, managing risk is sort of fundamental. I and mean, it's just, you know, you're just doing it the whole time and making judgments. Mm -hmm. And, um, 
you know, a sort of standard answer that I sometimes give to this is, well, you know, uh, all my life I've tried to manage risk, sometimes successfully, sometimes not. Um, but I do like to know what the risk is mm-hmm. um, before I decide whether to take it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so having good understanding of the risk, right. good understanding of situations, right. enables you to make you know serious mm-hmm. judgments mm-hmm. about whether and what the risk is, right. and then how to manage it. So, yeah, sure, you have to take risk, but it helps to know what what the risk is. Right, right. Um, so detailed work is um, beforehand and during is very very important. Right. And that's what you know. Good intelligence services are good at. Right. I um, I think I'd say. Yeah. No. I remember reading all those documents and learning what all those acronyms meant about reliability to very little reliability. But there's meant- a sort of there's a there's a, a, a if I'm here deeper uh, point here, which and this goes back to the point about human sources, technology, mm-hmm. and so on. You know, if I and I when I'm asked, well, if I had to sum up the key objective of intelligence work in the present day, or even in the past, and I had to put it in just one or two sentences, or one sentence, uh, I would say the key objective is to get into the mind of the other side. Uh-huh. Uh, so to truly understand uh-huh. what, say, your opponent or whatever it might be, uh, your adversary, your competitor, um, what they're actually thinking, what their view of the world mm-hmm. is, what their view of you is, mm-hmm. And so on. And time and time again, I've found that it's different from what we imagine. Mm -hmm. But we, time and time again, don't really have a good understanding of what's in the mind, let's say, of the Soviet Politburo. Right. Right. Because we make a lot of assumptions based on our own. And equally, they don't have a good, they didn't have a good understanding of us. So it cuts both ways. And it's really, you know, a really good human um, source probably gives you a better chance of achieving that right. than technology. Right. And you mentioned um, Oleg Goldievsky and uh, that, you know, there were incidents from his, his career which were critical in um, helping us to understand and our leaders, President Reagan or Mrs. Thatcher, uh, to get into the mind of the other side, yeah. which is very, very important. Yeah, and I think people often overestimate their ability to understand other people when yes, in fact they, they don't. Do. I mean, you see this a lot with China now. I think people, there are many people out there trying to interpret China and very few of them are Chinese. And it just makes me wonder <laughs> how much I can trust because it's, you know, it's obviously incredibly complicated. So my, the last question I want to ask about that position was, uh, and it's a little bit of a silly question and you're going to probably say it's completely wrong as well. But I did see when we were doing our research that you, uh, you signed letters and memos in green ink following the tradition of Captain Sir Mansfield Smith Cumming, the agency's founder. Now, is that true? <laughs> yes. Well, um, uh-huh. Yay. Uh, yes, well done. <laughs> uh, Mansfield Cumming was the first chief of the service. Um, the service was founded on the 1st of October, 1909. So our centenary was the 1st of October, 2009, and I was fortunate still to be just mm-hmm. in charge at that time. And um, Mansfield Cumming was a a Navy commander, I think, or Commodore, became a captain. um, But he was put in charge of the Secret Service Bureau, which was a joint operation, very, very small, with the um, what became the Security Service on the 1st of October 1909, put in, created by the Committee of Imperial Defence at that time, before in the run up to the First World War, well, before the First World War. And the service grew out of those very, very modest origins and he remained and he really fundamentally created it and created its um, atmosphere and its philosophy and its ethics and he remained head of it until hmm, i think 1922 wow my, my history is long, uh, not yeah. quite precise as but why sure. the green ink well now the green ink is because um, i think i'm right in saying this that senior officers in the navy and he was senior naval officer after a certain rank um, have the right to uh, write, or had the right um, to write um, in the days when people did write, with green ink. That was an uh-huh. indication of rank. Oh, okay. So he was conscious of that as uh-huh. an indication of rank. I see. And so he just did what other senior naval officers yeah. did. And it became a tradition. I think I'm right in saying that it really became a set tradition, well, certainly from 1916, and, and maybe uh, before that. And because his surname was coming, mm-hmm. he would sign uh-huh. himself in green ink with a C. Yeah. Because C also means chief. chief. Right. That tradition has continued. 
traditions sometimes are very important. Yeah, well, you know, I hope I'm not revealing state secrets, but I did get a Christmas card from uh, Alex Younger and he signed it C in green ink. Yes, so they are. <laughs> uh, and um, my understanding has always been that it's very much supported and appreciated by the members of the service. You don't do everything in green ink, just a few things. Well, of course, now you don't write much anyway. Right, um, right. But um, certainly when in, in my time, there was much more handwriting and um, uh, it's all in green ink, yeah. So I wonder why James... But the day you leave, you stop. And wonder why James Bond became, it turned it into M instead of C. Well, perhaps he was trying to protect secrets. <laughs> So you really did have a, a, a really fascinating career, given, you know, you were in Moscow at the height of the Cold War. Then you were in Moscow during the, the chaos of the collapse of the Soviet Union. You were chair of the JIC during 9-11 and the, and the Iraq War, the beginning of the Iraq War, and then head of SIS during all sorts of other enormous challenges. Uh, although it seems to me when you look back on at least the earlier part of your career and you compared to where we are today globally with so much uncertainty. I mean, back then we knew there were, who the good guys were and the bad guys. And today it just is, there's much more confusion at the global level. I mean, do you have any reflections on how we should be thinking about China, Russia, some of the, the bigger challenges that we're facing today? Well, I think one thing, uh, Karen, I'd say uh, there is that um, this is a general point covering all those uh, years. And well, the first thing I'd say is that I'm very conscious of how incredibly fortunate I was to work in such a wonderful organization mm -hmm. over um, all those years. It couldn't have been better in terms of the quality of the people and the quality of the work and quality of the organization. We tend now, you know, with the uncertainties that we think we have now, to look back to those days in the 70s and the 80s as somehow or another more predictable. But of course, the past is always predictable mm -hmm. and the future by definition is not. And we always have to remember that. And it didn't feel completely predictable and uh, uh, you know, one couldn't, uh, certainly didn't feel one could uh, foresee the future back then at the time. In 1991, you probably felt the well, same way. it wasn't way, just that. Right? In 1981, yeah. uh -huh. I felt yeah. it. I um, mean, the, the nuclear war scare in 1983 right. it was probably the single most uh, scary right. um, experience I had yeah. throughout my entire career. Mm -hmm. And that was the, the height of the Cold War when the Cold, you know, because we know how the Cold War ended. So, you know, we tend to think that it was a time of stability when actually it wasn't really. Yeah, people were doing nuclear exercises in school, right? Yeah. So that was... Uh, yeah, uh, so I, I think we need to be careful yeah. about keeping things in perspective. Um, that's... Um, um, I hear now people say we've never lived in, in more unpredictable times. And I used to hear them saying that last year. And I think, hang on a minute, this is the hundredth, the centenary of 1918. Was it more predictable in 1918? <laughs> I don't think so. Yeah. You know, so things are like that. And we need, you know, to keep things in perspective. And of course, above all, you need to know what your values are. Uh, you need to know where your loyalties lie. You need to know who your allies and your friends are. And you need to understand you know, what part of human society you are working with and for. And then you need to make sure that you understand other powerful players. And, um, you know, now, you know, essentially, um, we are part of the world of liberal democracy. Uh, society is based on the rule of law and with a strong concept of freedom. You, you know, people argue about the degree of freedom of speech and thought and so on. But essentially, that's a fundamental concept. In other parts of the world, there are authoritarian societies which are not based on the rule of law um, for all sorts of reasons, understandable sometimes, uh, historical and so on. Um, societies uh, have developed in different ways and very authoritarian ways. And that's the world that we have to manage with and protecting our own values and, and our own advantages. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's complicated. Yeah, it's complicated and that's why I think tanks like Arusi exist. Um, so we're coming to the end, just briefly touching on your current portfolio after you left government service. You really have a nice mix of private sector and some charitable work. You were chair of Bletchley oh, for a number of years, yes. right? And uh, stepped down from that, but you're vice chair at RUSI and working for a number of other charities. Uh, you obviously were knighted in uh, 2007 yep. and uh, received some other honors from the UK. You were... Uh, given the Legion d'honneur in 2011 yep. and really have had 
you know, a, a, just a career to, that I would imagine to be proud of, but really a current portfolio that seems very rich and fulfilling as well. Um, so I guess the last question I always ask people is what advice you would give to the younger generation who are interested in a career in foreign affairs, but maybe don't have an idea about exactly what they want to do. Should they work for government? Should they go, you know, work in the field somewhere for an NGO? What would you recommend based well, on your own experience? Um, everybody, you know, is going to have slightly different qualities and slightly different wishes and so on. So I suppose as a general piece of advice, I say if you're clear that you want to work in the area of international affairs, international issues, or yes, with international issues, which may have nothing to do with, you know, traditional foreign policy, maybe social issues or, or whatever, then fine, you know, realize it's demanding. It's you know, physically stressful sometimes. It's quite a lot of movement, quite a lot of instability. Mm -hmm. But also, in different ways, very, very stimulating, and it depends what stimulates you. Mm -hmm. So you have to think hard, know yourself, and you know, think carefully, if you can, about, um, about how you want to commit yourself, because you only live once. And my experience has been certainly that decisions you take when you're young, and in your 20s, you may not realise at the time, can absolutely be critical you know, mm -hmm. for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. That was certainly true in uh, in my case, and it was very very lucky that decisions I took turned out to be I think good and personal and um, and and of course professional. But of course, one area in which you can work, you know, international uh, relations in one way or another is with government. Certainly, uh, that clearly includes my um, old service. I can only speak for your, um, myself. But I'm also speaking, I think, for quite a lot of other people when I say this. I mean, I was in uh, the work of the intelligence community almost entirely, not quite entirely, in my service for 38 years to the day, actually. Mm -hmm. And I never had a dull moment. I never had a boring day. Mm -hmm. I, I can't remember waking up in the morning and thinking, I don't want to go to work today. Uh, in fact, I don't remember thinking that it was work, mm -hmm. you know. It was just part of your life and what you did. And I honestly think that there were many people and are many people just like that. Yeah. So if you find that attractive, then maybe that's good. Yeah, great, great. Well, that's good to hear. Well, Sir John Scarlett, uh, former chief of SIS, MI6, and Vice Chairman Arusi, thank you for your time today. Thank you, Karen. Thank you for listening to today's podcast. We always appreciate any comments, positive or negative. Please email them to us or tweet us at rusi underscore org or hashtag in context. All the podcasts are on the Rusi website. So please do go back and listen to any of the ones that you have missed and send us comments. This podcast was produced by Tom Ascott, developed by Caroline Tranter, with further research from Neil Watling. Keep up to date with the latest defense and security analysis by visiting www.rusi.org.